There are several patrols to undertake, but first off we have a mission to intercept another Borg incursion into our realm. This one is a rather major fissure through which they're attempting the ambitious feat of dragging an entire Unicomplex. If they manage this, then they'd have a ready-made stronghold and staging ground in our universe, a beachhead from which they can spread even if we seal the rift. This is also the first mission where we get to work alongside the Aetherians and their lone starship, the Harmony. The enemy has started to bring their Unicomplex into your dimension. We will stop this. We must. To do so, we need to destroy ten dimensional conveyors on the surface of the Unicomplex. Once we have done so, we shall deploy stitching anchors around its perimeter to form a network with my vessel. The Harmony. The Harmony will project shielding to each deployed anchor. It will take time to fully energize the shielding, and the Borg will attempt to disrupt the process and disable the anchors. Do not allow this. When the anchors are fully shielded and projecting stitching beams to the Harmony, we shall energize the network. The Vortex will be closed, destroying the Unicomplex in the process. Through Harmony, we are secure. Through unity, we are strong. Borg reinforcements will periodically arrive to defend the Unicomplex until we seal the Vortex. Therefore, we will need to achieve our objectives before the enemy forces grow too strong. The Unicomplex is well defended with weapon emplacements, tractor beam arrays, cutting beams, and torpedo launchers. It also possesses a number of launch ports capable of deploying Borg spheres. Neutralize these defenses as needed, but understand that the enemy will regenerate them over time. So, we set about our task. There are endless spheres and probes to take care of, as well as the Unicomplex's mounted weaponry. We can target many of these to halt their advance and deployment, but, as our mission handler, the Thassine Fae, states, these are only temporary. Additionally, there are large assimilator vessels that are coming through in tandem with the Unicomplex and attempting to escape the area, in the hopes of getting to work elsewhere, doing what the name implies. We can take these out too, however if we do let some slip by, it'll just fall to some other task force. When we've destroyed the dimensional conveyors, the Unicomplex's process halts and we can begin to deploy the tethers to close the rift. These are vulnerable pieces of equipment and need to be shielded by the Harmony, so our mission after deploying them is to protect them, taking special care to attack any smaller spheres that make a beeline for them. These Borg are not idiots, they see what we're doing. After all are energised and shielded by the Harmony, which takes some time for each tether, the Borg try something else. Two large tactical cubes are deployed from deep within the Unicomplex. There's a funny perspective thing going on here because this complex looks flat to us, but like an iceberg, the remainder of it is below the surface, in this case, of the rift in its own universe. The hatch is just in ours. This is just... there's a lot of setup for a joke here. When the interfering cubes are destroyed, there's nothing left to stop us closing the rift right on the Unicomplex that it's partially emerged. The door shuts, shearing the complex in two. With the rift closed, we've halted the potential incursion into our universe, but they may try again. Fortunately, bringing through a structure as large as the Unicomplex is troublesome, but not impossible, so we need to curtail it if this ever happens again. Our efforts were most satisfactory on this day. The enemy incursion has been thwarted. Your contributions were a critical part of our success. Well done. Through harmony, we are secure. Through unity, we are strong. With that mission dealt with, we move on to our patrols in Romulan territory. 
The first sector we patrol is the Demorus sector, where the named planet of Demorus 2 requires no assistance, so we press on. The first stop is the Liar system. There is an M-class planet in here that is uninhabited by intelligent life. However, there are ruins on the planet that suggest there was a civilization at one point that died out three and a half thousand years ago in a civil war. But today, we're doing a follow-up survey. Entering the system, we find a startling sight of interstellar dust illuminated by the bright sun and an enticing looking planet. I wonder why it was never resettled. Seems like some free real estate to me, and one that surely the Romulans would be all over post-supernova. We close in on the planet and begin scans. It's not long before Nubia detects uncatalogued objects on the surface that we're mapping today, so we beam down to investigate. The planet's surface temperature is temperate, and the view is scenic, with plenty of flora. Again, why no colonies? It's not even like there's anything suspicious going on. The only thing I can think of is that the Federation wants to fully explore the planet and its history before any effort to settle it takes place, but it's not in Federation territory, it's a Romulan system. Eventually we find one of these items, a stone marker of some kind, carved and upright, surrounded in a sheltered location. Investigating the runes and patterns, Science Officer Tamet notes with surprise that it corresponds to ancient Klingon mummification glyphs of the Zangthalklot dynasty, an ancient Klingon house long gone and shrouded in the murk of time. There are no records to indicate that the Klingons even made it this far into space while that dynasty was around, so this is a startling find. These are grave markers, and with the amount discovered it would suggest a sizeable colony. Were these the same inhabitants of 3,500 years ago? If so, this suggests interstellar travel from the Klingons before even the Herc arrived, and this deep into what would become Romulan space? Oh my god, the Klingons were here before the Romulans were. Well, this sounds like a land claim waiting to happen, let's just report our findings and let the diplomats work this one out. Our next mission is to the Voran system, where we stop off at Voran Prime. This is an L-class world, which means a planet that's almost capable of supporting life, but some element prevents it being suitable for colonisation. Slightly too much carbon dioxide. Poisonous grass, or something like. It's still being surveyed for suitability by the Federation and Star Empire in a rare example of cooperation. Nobody tell them about the last planet we passed. Entering the system, we're confronted by a greenish-yellow orb and a message from the chief scientist of the survey team asking us to make orbit and then call down. So after closing in, Dr. Edward Grissom answers our hail and tells us that his investigation is supplemented by probes. However, after detecting some unknown artefacts on the eastern continent, they dispatched probes to investigate, and none returned. Several were even destroyed. Naturally, they are now worried, and do not want to send their team in case it turns out there are hostiles. So he asked for an equipped team to go look for them. Here we are. Me and my engineering officer beam down to look around and find some structures here. These look rather unblemished and like colony builds, perhaps? However, they're currently abandoned. So far, there is nothing capable of shooting down a probe. However, we investigate a structure and find behind the building an interesting discovery. Giving it a scan, we learn it's an Iconian device. These buildings might not be, but I say these strange edifices definitely are, which explains the probes losing contact. Iconian tech often unintentionally disrupts our systems. There's no enemy here, no hostile, just some ancient relics that mess with the probes. I guess that's some good news. Rather than shut them down, we just mark the location of all six of them and report our findings. Dr. Grissom thanks us and mentions he'll contact a team from Daystrom to investigate these ruins in particular. Clearing up this incident, we beam back and move on. Our next stop 
is the Saritia system. Saritia 3 being home to a Romulan colony that has broken away from the Star Empire and is in the process of forming its own government. The Federation has a diplomatic envoy on the surface too, and these Saritian Romulans have asked for official aid while they do this. The Romulan Star Empire, however, is not leaving them alone and in fact preparing to forcibly retake the system, so we're here to act as a deterrent. There are five squadrons in the system, and once we've driven them all off, we can call back Solara and tell her our job is done. Our next location is a high 2. This planet is an M-class world orbited by a large D-class moon. Exobiologists have noted similarities between the genetics and culture of the natives with the Teferi people, half a quadrant away. This is a suspected case of parallel development, but some still suggest a common ancestor. We arrive in the system and are hailed by Astra Blocks, who explains that their sensor arrays on the western continent have given some strange readings. Okay. She explains that they don't have the staff to investigate, so while we are on patrol, we can assist the investigation of some newly encountered organisms. Could they be dangerous? We beam down to take a look. Once more, we have a nice M-class climate to frolic in. Temet mentions that she's picking up electromagnetic readings that are organic in nature, but with a frequency that might suggest communication. Could it be rudimentary or complex? Let's take a look, maybe even encounter a new alien species, a new first contact. This, this is exciting. Uh, are, are you sure this is it? It looks like a deflated potato. And it's not even moving. Ah, this is the source of the readings, all right. This lump. No toxins or radiations, emissions that would be harmful at least, so I guess that's something. We head off in search of others, and we do find a few more nearby, so we scan them too. However, after studying them long enough, we learn that they are single-celled creatures on a macro scale, a protozoa of advanced evolution not seen since the space amoeba of 2268, at least they're not that large. They are apparently capable of extruding pseudopods to move, but require another of their kind to reproduce. These signals we are reading are their mating calls, and probably they're in the process of developing into the next stage of the revolution. Give it a few millennia, and with single cells this large, who knows what we'd get. We inform Astra of our finds, and she says they'll track this new species carefully. We move on to the Talis system, now into the Vendor sector. Talis is a system notable for its dilithium reserves, but recently a decalithium vein was uncovered on Talis 3, so now everyone nearby wants a piece Federation, Romulan, and even the roaming Herogen. Entering the system, Commander Argus Genstra, the overseer of operations in the Vendor Sector, contacts us to inform us that the Romulan Star Empire forces have made a move on this system, and we are to drive them out. Sure thing! This system is in Romulan space, however, but I assume the Star Empire has no claim to this particular planet outside of negotiations or some treaty. At least I hope that's the case, otherwise I feel a little bad about chasing them out of, you know, their own territory. Our next stop is Rakol 2, an uninhabited Class C planet shrouded in ice. However, in 2391, a group of holograms settled its surface in the hollow emitter-laden domes. These holograms are led by Dr. Marius, a former EMH Mark I who was liberated from the Sirius Sector mines by activists from within the Soong Foundation. These holograms now seek to explore and define holographic sentience alongside science teams in orbit of their world. That's really cool! Unfortunately, our mission here is more of the shooty shooty bang bang variety, as the Herogen have learned about these holograms and want a piece of the action, enamoured as they are at the idea of infinitely programmable and sentient prey. 
our mission is to protect this world, so we set about driving off the Hirogen attackers. Five enemy vessels later, we're told the system is secure and we're free to leave. This system has such an awesome premise that I'm sorry we don't get to beam down and take a look around. The hologram movement towards freedom is one that was started by the Doctor of Voyager but built on the rights of synthetics like Data and the Capelius androids. This was built on over generations, so it's great to see something come of it, and a topic that would be wonderful to explore. Generally, artificial life forms have to adhere to strict programming limitations to prevent accidental emergence intelligence. But when this does happen, the UFP has a responsibility to safeguard its creations. We leave the system and pass the Kazan cluster, where colony efforts are underway. Our next stop is the ominously red Tefray system, which houses a class 1 supergiant planet of 212 Kelvin, and Tefray 2, which is covered in nitrogen ice 3000 meters thick. This gives it the unofficial nickname of the System of Fire and Ice. In this system, we have a squat and rotund station situated in a dust cloud while an unknown artifact drifts throughout. This is what we are here to investigate, and we learn that it is a Tacon thing. Unsure of what we have actually found, only who built it, we find four more around the planet and report our finds. The mission concludes, the final stop in the Vendor Sector, and we're free to continue our missions in Romulan space. There are some standout premises here in this sector, I think, with the hologram set up the numerous missions investigating old civilizations and ruins, and the failed first contact with the deflated slug. So, thanks for watching this part of our Star Trek Online patrol missions. And we're set to continue with our investigations while we await more content in the next chapter of the storyline series to release. Until then, thanks for watching. I've been Rick, thanks again, and goodbye.